to meet you. Nice to meet nice you, sir. Jared. Oh, yeah. Jared, very nice to meet you as well. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for uh, for coming in here. This is fantastic. Wow. All right, a packed house. How are you? This is terrific. So they, um, hello, everybody. Ah, Mr. Gro. <laughs> mention yes wow back on the stage yes well it's funny um, hello everybody how are you good to see you so my name is Rick Collins I am the president of the Nassau County Bar Association thank you uh, I'm also uh, in addition to being a criminal defense lawyer I'm also a former actor so I actually have the distinction of being, I think, the only actor that appeared in all four or five Toxic Avenger movies. I played the lead villain in Toxic 2 and 3. Um, I was in Troma's War, Class of Nukem High, um, Kabuki Man, um, and a few others that I... Nukem High by Adam? I might have been. I might have been. Um, I, I, I have been all around. I, in the first class of Newcomb High, I played Ron Sims, who was a nuclear power plant worker that sold radioactive marijuana to high school kids and caused them to mutate. That is, that was one of my, my first roles. So, so uh, yes, the, um, the act, and, and I, uh, I still do. I, I had a tiny little walk-on in the first season of The Sopranos playing a cop. Um, before I had ever seen or even knew what it was. I had an agent at the time, and the agent's like, you know, we got this little thing for you in this new series. It's called The Sopranos. And I'm like, is it like a like an opera? Like an opera thing, right? It, it, he's like, no, it's it's a mob, mob thing. It's going to be mafia stuff. I'm like, name The Sopranos? It's never going to go anywhere. <laughs> so, of course, I, I loved it. So, well, this is great. It's nice to be outside of Domus. Um, I'll do my, my pitch, certainly, Nassau County uh, Bar Association, Domus, uh, we have a caterer. Please come for lunch as often as you can. If there's anything like, like um, uh, Ed Koch used to say, how am I doing? If there's anything that I can do better as the president of the Nassau County Bar Association, please do not hesitate to call me. I'm easily accessible. Rick Collins, uh, go to rickcollins.com, and you can even find some stuff about the movies that I've done. But, um, but thank you all for coming in, and I'm looking forward to this uh, very, very much. Thank you again. All right, good evening. Hello, hello, hello. All right, good evening and welcome. Hey. Another mic. Yeah, no, this, this is your radio, it's right? <laughs> mic check. Oh, here we go. All right, first of all, welcome. Welcome to my father's place. And I have a great panel here. That to my left is Alex Ewan. Uh, president of Road Warrior Entertainment and the Chief Operating Officer of My Father's Place, which is where you are, uh, Michael Epi Epstein, who is the founder of My Father's Place, and Jared Ring, who does incredible security. Uh, he just did security for Heart at uh, Jones Beach not that long ago with Joan Jett. Uh, he does security for Madonna and Cindy Lauper. And you know, one of the things that you know lawyers always have to worry about are security issues. So we're going to have that. Just a quick start. Um, we're going to take a break, uh, but during the break, come and ask us questions. We're here for you. I have a microphone for everybody to ask questions. Take off your jackets. Make yourself at home. Uh, some of the bar lectures can be, you know, very, very tedious. We're going to try to make this fun and interesting. Uh, first of all, I've got to thank all of our crew here, uh, John, who does great sound, Peter, Mark, our stage manager, because uh, the behind-the-scenes people, and Donna from the Nassau Bar, they make all these events possible. Okay. So if you look at the graphic behind me, you'll see that Bruce Springsteen appeared this week in 1975 at my father's place. And, with, and then in the same week today, it would have been David Bromberg, just to show you how much the music industry has changed. Um, so just to get started, I want to talk, everybody talk a little bit about their quick bios, and then we're going to go into a lot of, and we're going to go a little off script, because in the entertainment business, that's what you get to do. All right, so to, to start, we have Alex. Yes, I'm Alex Hewen. Um, I'm the uh, CEO of Road Warrior Entertainment, which um, is uh, 
Our goal is to help new artists. And in order to help new artists today, you have to come up with really different, unique ways to promote them and to support them. In my mind, um, not only do we enjoy finding new talent, and it's a real joy, and Epi's been doing that since the days of Bruce Springsteen, but, um, but also it's important for the industry itself. Um, the new talent is what makes the industry thrive, ultimately. Um, the industry is based upon artists. And so that's what we do at Road Warrior Entertainment, and we do, thro do so through concerts, through films, through television shows, and, um, and I've been fortunate to have produced some of the biggest concerts in the world, um, Times Square, New Year's Eve for ABC, ESPN, um, festivals, um, on Randall's Island, festivals all over the world, in Thailand, Asia. So um, we have a lot of experience in the live music production scene. And in addition, many, many, many of my productions have become films or television shows or a combination of both. And so when we had the opportunity to restart my father's place, naturally this was a beautiful room we wanted it to be a venue where everybody could see the artists, where everybody could hear beautifully, and, um, and where we could showcase new artists as well as uh, older artists. So um, I'm very happy to be here, and um, I hope you find what we say informative. And on to my mentor, Epi. Epi. So what am I, am I doing my thing yeah. now? Yeah. Just do my thing? Just yeah. your, your bio right Just now. Just your bio. Your right bio. Right. Uh, well, my bio is a kid from Brooklyn. I came to Long Island took over Bowling Alley and started to try to do shows. And, um, and, and then along, somewhere along the line, I met Alex and we started working with Little Steven and got Little Steven's underground garage together. And um, then I sat home for about 40 years. <laughs> so I said I wouldn't open a club after they kicked me out of the building on Bryant Avenue in 1987, unless it was in Roslyn, which was a pretty stupid thing to do. So I wasted 35 years. The club could have been anywhere, but I had some kind of a mental problem about it. So here we are. And uh, now we're going to open up another club in Palm Beach County. Alex and I are going down to look at real estate on Wednesday. Is that good enough? Yeah. And by the way, we have, we're, we're working on both a uh, television show as well. Which you guys can talk about. Which is starting in January on... Uh, Fios Channel 14 will be WVVH Hamptons Television, and we'll talk about that. So this is kind of the, the leak of that cool information. And, um, and last but certainly not least is Jared Ring. And Thank you. I want you to introduce yourself. Hi, folks. Uh, thanks for being here tonight. Uh, my name is Jared Ring. I'm a former New York City police officer and a former New York State detective, as well as a uh, paramedic supervisor. I'm also a New York State licensed private investigator, and uh, I'm a subject matter expert on counterterrorism. Uh, specifically pertaining to uh, large mass gathering events and uh, sports and entertainment venues. And uh, hopefully I'll uh, have some great information to share with you tonight in case any of your clients uh, are facing any type of litigation. And uh, we'll go from there. All right. All right so what, what inspired us sort of to do this program, so I'll start with a joke. So what started us was, you know, a comedian go, calls up his uh, agent and he says, what do you got for me this weekend? And the agent says, well, I got, a, I got a gig for you in Elmira, 150 bucks. And he says, 150 bucks? I have to drive up there. There's tolls. It's going to cost me for the hotel room. And the agent says, well, you got to save up for these things. So, you know, people really want to know, can, can you still make money in music and entertainment given streaming, you know, YouTube and all these other things that have really changed? You know, when you saw the graphic of, of Springsteen and Bromberg, they didn't have to compete with that. You know, in those days... A WLIR uh, was there to support both the venue and the music and everything else. And a lot of that has really evolved. So to kind of navigate us through those waters, it's going to be Alex is going to talk about sort of the whole uh, media and entertainment industry. And Peter, if you can switch the graphic to my screen. Should I, should I switch it? Yeah, to my laptop. Oh, okay. So, you know, we'll do in the meantime. Why don't we start with some stories from Epi? Just for a little Once background. upon a time. Okay. <laughs> All right, but that's okay. We'll, we'll keep that in the background. All right, Technical so glitches. All right, so I'm, I'm just going to tell you about swords and sorcery because when I opened the club in 1971, 
It was a very difficult thing. Uh, I had one friend, Richie Havens, who played for us on Memorial Day. And uh, we sold out. And then it took months and months to try to get, a ta uh, get, to get attractions to play the club. One of the scenarios was that there was a gentleman named Lou Adler who started a record label called <coughs> Dunhill Records, which he sold to ABC later on. But one of the acts that he, he was a record producer, basically, Jewish kid from Chicago. And he had produced a, a pretty big album called Tapestry with Carol King. So Carol King was playing sometime 1971 at a club in the city on Bleecker Street called The Bitter End. She was doing seven nights, two shows a night. I did not know anyone in the music industry. So I just called him cold. I said, Mr. Adler, I have a club that seats 475 people. I'll pay for two shows in one night, what the bitter end is paying you for 14 shows. And I, I don't know what happened on the other side of the line, but it was like something like this. <laughs> and he hung up the phone. So I didn't ever get to talk to Mr. Adler at that time. However, later on in my career, after I became what I, what you know, what the club was sometime around 1976. One of his artists called Cheech and Chong played, and I was able to get three options on the act, exercisable, over three years. So I got him back, but I want to go back to the beginning. The point I'm trying to make is that the music industry in the, in the 60s, the 50s, the 70s, was like one big wheel with spokes all over the place. And I, found out later that I was being used to become one of those spokes by the, the music industry. But I didn't know that. That I had pretty much no control as to what was going to happen. And I guess we were lucky that we had WLIR to help because those live radio broadcasts that we did Tuesday night really did give way to building some rock stars here on Long Island. But I'd get phone calls like this. Hey, how are you, Effie? I'm from such and such a record company. We got a new band called The Dildos that McNamara is going to play at LIR. And uh, listen, we want you to book them. We're going to give you $500 worth of tickets. We're going to give tickets away on the radio. And you pay them $500. Everyone who shows up, we'll give them a badge and a T-shirt. Not a record, of course. And we'll all come out from the record label and drink. Well, I knew how record people like to get drunk. So I figured, hey, this is a good deal. I don't know who the band is. I never heard of them, but they're going to play them on the radio. They're going to give tickets away. And I pay them 500 bucks, and they're going to give away $500 worth of tickets. Well, that was a pretty common phone call in the 70s because there was just so many recording artists that needed a place to play. But even going back further, I was having a lot of trouble buying talent. And, and I didn't know what I was doing wrong. And I would go up to the booking agencies and the agents would laugh at me. I scribbled. And, and, and um, then there was a, 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 an occasion when some guy kept calling me late at night. And he didn't tell me his name. But he said, I'm going to help you. I want you to do a few things for me. If your PA system and the monitors, meaning the back, you know, the, the equipment that the, the bands can hear themselves out of, is right, if you build a good dressing room, and if the sight lines are, are right, will make your club a showcase club in the country. I found out this gentleman's name later was Lou Adler who had a record company called Bearsville Records and managed an awful lot of acts, including Bob Dylan, Joni Mitchell, et cetera. So he went ahead and got me a group called The Band right after they were huge. <laughs> they played for me. So I became what we say in, in the mob business. I was a made man because now all of a sudden I had a couple of names under my belt so that 
the floodgates started to open and there was other attractions to get. But it took a long time for that to happen. I had to spend money I didn't have on, on putting together the PA, the lights, the dressing room, and, 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 and the equipment was very expensive and it was very hard to find because it was, it was still a new technology. Having more than a two-way monitor system was, was still considered to be uh, you know, space age technology. So we made the commitment, we borrowed and, and stole the, mo the money to build the room. And I guess it paid off with friends like that. On one occasion, uh, a gentleman who was a wonderful agent who was partners with Bill Graham, his name was Herb Spar. He died of cancer, but Herb started an agency called IFA, which became, C became I ICM. And uh, when I'd go up to see him in the office, all the agents that I dealt business with, he was the president of the agency, they'd laugh at my handwriting, as I was telling you. And he took my book and he said, oh, I can read all this. You have this, this, this. I said, yeah, I have a friend who writes just like that. And he said, his name is Graham. I said, wow, and they all shut up. All the, all the kids in the office shut up. This particular person, Herb Spar, on an occasion called me up and he said, Epi, next Thursday afternoon at 3.30, I need the club because we're gonna audition a band from Milton, Massachusetts. And the people of Columbia are gonna come out and Clive Davis is looking at this act very carefully. There can be no one in the club except for a bartender and your technical staff. So that band was called Aerosmith. I don't know whether they got signed that, that afternoon because they did two or three other auditions, but the mere fact that I was asked to do a favor and I did it was part of what the star making machinery was to me at that time because it was, you do this and we will do that. You do this, we'll do that. Almost like the ancient days uh, of England when there were, were, were cities, there were cities and there were dukes and there were duchesses and, and there were kings and queens and then I was a vassal. And all of a sudden from a vassal I became a knight. From a knight maybe I was working my way up to getting my own kingdom till the village of Roslyn closed this up. And then I became a vassal again and here I am again as a, a knight or a vassal. But um, so many stories, I want to come up with the right ones. Um, I can't read my writing. Bill Graham can read your writing. What? Bill Graham can read my writing. <laughs> um, it seems that there were so many artists and they all need a pay, they needed a place to play and as their records came out and the publicity, promotion, the advertising, the marketing for those, the one thing, those phonograph discs, those LPs became the most important things in the world. The record companies didn't give them away. You had to buy the record. And it seemed like there weren't enough places to play that had a PA system, that had a stage, there were bars that had little crappy PAs, but if you're gonna have an act tour, you had to have all the coup de tete, you know, you have all the equipment. And actually we, we did the work, so we had it. So night after night, there'd be record company acts playing up the block on Bryant Avenue, night after night. And then, and then it, it just built into something. But when I was a kid, there weren't any LPs. I'd go to the record store at Roosevelt Field, I think it was called Colony Records. And we, we, there were dozens and dozens of bins that had LPs in them. But those bins were, they were language records, they were soundtracks to Broadway or to movie soundtracks. And once in a while there was a best of by Elvis Presley or the Elvely Brothers. But up until the time that, you know, Sergeant Pepper taught the band to play, uh, meaning the Beatles put out Sgt. Pepper, 
there wasn't really a big market for LPs. Everything was 45s, everything. And you'd go to the store and you'd say, let me listen to the B-side. And if there was something on the B-side, you'd pay the 39 cents in the taxes and you'd get the record, put it in your collection. So after Sergeant Pepper, every one of those record guys, those powerhouses, would be selling LPs because they'd make five bucks a record instead of 39 cents a record. And th th that's where all the power started in the, in, the, in, the, in the record industry. And it was just, it just never ended, never ended. You could go to the airport and get on a plane and there's a rack of records, you could buy a record. There were re records were everywhere. And uh, there was just no end to the promotion of records. And it was all about the recordings on vinyl and people to fall in love with them and become fanatic about the records. And that's all gone. Everything, everything I'm talking about is gone. It was just a time that I don't think we'll ever see again, which is sort of sad. And um, I think we should touch on what's, where we're going with this because I think that uh, those guys that ran the record industry, if you want to read a good book, it's called The Hitmen. It's, a, it's sort of a scary book, but there was so much power that these guys that were record executives and the people that worked for them had that th they could do things like this. It's a band called Barnaby By. And Barnaby By is made up of Bobby and Billy Alessi, who was, uh, um, they were in the Broadway cast of Hair, Pepe Castro from the Blues Magoos, and Mike Riccadell from The Illusion, but they all got together at the Broadway cast of Hair and they started writing songs together and they played at Huntington Hartford's Supper Club in 1972. And they, there was an advertisement that Huntington Hartford put in a paper and it said, Barnaby by tonight. And Ahmed Erdogan, who was president of Atlantic Records, same man who produced Aretha Franklin and um, uh, who else did he produce that was great? Uh, doesn't matter. We don't care. And so many. Yeah. And uh, so Ahmed came down in a car thinking that these guys, uh, they were terrible. They sounded horrible. But uh, Ahmed put him in his limousine and brought him to his house and then produced a record with them. But they were terrible. But the thing was that Ahmed thought that, that, that because their name was Barnaby By that he'd meet some young boys. And, and that was start part of the industry that happened at that time, the power that these guys had. So what happened was I started managing these guys, not knowing the story I told you. And I, and I found out that the record that Ahmed was producing went into the garbage and they were gonna start over. And the predecessor to um, and Erdogan was Jerry Greenberg, and he took the record out of the garbage, put a cover on it, and it made its way into that flow of, of uh, record distribution. And of course, Ahmed was laughed out of being president of Atlantic and moved upstairs to Warner Electric. And that's when I came in and started managing the act, and that was a mess, which I'll talk about some other, at some other meeting. <laughs> the point I'm making is, is that there was so much power that these guys had that they could do literally anything. They said, I'm gonna make you a star. They'd make you a star. Didn't matter what you sounded like. You would get your airplay on the radio because the radio stations did whatever the record companies told them to do. You'll play this record, not that record. And they would pay for it. They paid for everything. That's why when we, when we were all kids, the ones that are old, yeah, tickets, tickets to concerts were cheap, but you had to buy the record. You had to buy the LP. So um, there was another story I wanted to tell, but I don't remember what it was. Uh, so, yes, do you have an idea for it? Mm. All right, so why, why, why don't we you move? Want to ask me a question? Well, let me let me shift over to Alex. Because Alex has got a whole thing about where where the industry is now, because right, that did, was did, that was. Is there anything else you wanted me to add? Just said and we'll. 
Thank you. All right. So, and so, you, so that was then. So Alex is going to talk about the now because that's what this class is about is how do you thrive today. But it's important to have some context because the industry really has changed so much. And Alex is going to talk about the difference between sort of the music industry and the overall entertainment industry. So why don't you – so I, I had the graphic, so. You got it? Okay. Yeah. Well, I want to start by first saying that um, – yeah, just yeah, I, oh. yeah, but well, you can put it up. Yeah, what put up. when I um, yeah. I got into the industry just as it was transforming, and it um, so what happened is the industry was ruled, as Epi says, by really just a handful of very powerful individuals, and they could make or break a club, they could make or break an act, and um, I remember that what happened was was that. Part of it had to do with the control of the distribution. So what you had was, was that in order to get on the radio, you had to pay. In order to get into the stores, you had to pay. To have a hit on the radio in 1990, uh, when I was getting involved, you would have to put up $250,000. To have your Records in the stores up front, not behind somewhere in the back at $20 or $18 a CD, but up front discounted to $11.99 or whatever. You had to pay the stores and ultimately, and that was another $250,000. In fact, the ante to put out a record was <coughs> $2 million. They were being, the record companies were being extorted by radio, by stores, by publicists, and they loved it. They loved it. They wouldn't have minded if they charged him 300000 or 400000 because what it meant was that no kid in his basement was ever going to have a hit record. It just wasn't going to happen. And they, at that time, names like Armand Erdogan and um, Clive Davis and people like that, um, at that time, the industry was just about undergoing to start to undergo a transition. And they refused to change, and they fought this transition tooth and nail, and they lost. And what you have today is that record companies are no longer a factor in the music industry. Record stores have disappeared completely and totally. They're extinct. And radio no longer serves as the way to introduce artists. So what you have is a completely new transformed industry, and to a large extent, it's gone from being a fiefdom to being in a wide open arena and nobody really knows where it's going. And so in that arena, I want to talk a little bit about just the, the concept of, of the music industry and some, uh, some basic factors. And um, one of the basic things, okay, so it's starting with is that the music industry, uh, American music industry is the largest in the world. It compromises right now. 30% of the global entertainment, and, and, and we're talking, this is true of the music industry and it's true of the entertainment industry as a whole. In fact, the music industry is even larger as a percentage of the global industry than the entertainment industry. And only recently has China become a major market. As you can see, in 2016, it moved to second, and it's moving very quickly, but even still, the United States dwarfs it. And the truth is, is that in many ways, this doesn't really take into consideration the entire industry. So for example, food and beverage, which is a major part of the industry when it comes to live shows and things like that, is not included in these, um, in these figures of $1,717 billion. So, um, and the many ancillary businesses that spin off of it, the fact that music is used to sell everything and it's part of everything, whether you listen to it in a restaurant or you listen to it on TV, there's all these various different, so, so the, this doesn't really reflect the entire impact of the music industry. One of the things that happened also was that in, at the period of time when Epi was getting started through the time when I started in the early 90s, there was no way to know how much anybody was making. So these powerful figures really concealed to everybody what was going on and it, Part of the revolution was SoundScan. And SoundScan was a means by which you could simply scan anything, you know, retail items. And it, would, it was used by retail stores and people like that to 
basically uh, monitor inventory. And, um, but what happened is, is that SoundScan basically began taking all the scan sales that were happening in record stores and any store, for that matter, and began uh, counting them. Before, people had counted, called up a few record stores, how many Beatles albums are they selling this week or whatever, and that's how people came up with it. And what they found out was there was a lot of records being sold. And in fact, what amazed them was there were a lot of country records being sold. And these country records were being sold out of gas stations and truck stops and, <laughs> you know, all these. And it's like, <laughs> whoa. Just so you know, Nashville is really the music capital of the world right now. Everybody's moving there. All the publishing companies there. All the record labels there. That's an aside. But the thing was, was that it really transformed the business, too. Because what happened is, is that this mafia, shall we say, that controlled the music business and... To a certain extent, these, these type of situation that was true of the entertainment industry as a whole, um, as people began to see where the money was going and things like that, a big struggle began to ensue to open up the industry, which it did, and, um, and create a more transparent way to understand how people are, um, how, how the money was made and where, when, and where the money was being made. Um, but be that as it may, the United States um, entertainment industry is globally dominant. It exports a tremendous amount. It had a $13 billion uh, surplus last year, and that includes everything that's come in. So it's globally dominant. So if we go to the next slide, um, the entertainment industry is large and varied. We're going to talk to a certain extent about all of it, but we're going to focus on the music industry since that's kind of where we're more familiar with. But um, but as you can see, the entertainment industry includes many components, commercials, television, film, radio, books. And as you can see, television is the largest, but film, books, video games are significant. Music is significant, and theater is not quite as significant. Um, and on the other hand, this doesn't really reflect the nature of the entertainment industry because it is so intertwined, it's very difficult to separate components. So, for example, films end up on TV, music is used everywhere, books are now read, are streamed. So, so the, the whole thing is, is, is actually is very difficult to separate one sector from another. And, um, uh, but even still, it's a giant industry. It employs a million and a half people in the United States. And like I said, that doesn't really reflect the ripple effect that the industry has. It's a very large industry. Um, and it's a really one of America's most successful industries. And as I said, the music industry um, is dominant, even more dominant as a whole than the entertainment industry. To be a true star, an international recording star, you have to make it in America. Um, it really is the step. And everybody wants to come here and make it here. Um, just like people want to go to New York City and make it, but um, so, and you have, you've had numerous attempts by other artists in other countries, particular countries such as Japan, France, Germany, sponsored by their record companies to come here and try to make it, and they failed for one reason or another. Very few have succeeded, but there, there are those. But the thing is, is that the goal is America. America is the place to make it if you want to be in it international star. Um, one of the things that we would do was we, we would bring, I learned this actually from the NBA. I learned this from the NBA when they told me that when a foreign player becomes a player for the NBA, they basically own that country. In fact, that's what the vice president of uh, NBA operations told me. We own that country. And so you get Yao Ming, and all of a sudden, all of China is just watching NBA games. In fact, <laughs> NBA is extremely powerful in China. So the idea of bringing artists and making them successful in the United States may not benefit them internationally in the sense that if, even if they don't make it in the United States, they still become celebrities in their home country. And it increases their sales in their own home, home country just by virtue of the fact that they manage to tour or somehow or another you know, perform in the United States. So the United States is the place. Everybody wants to go. It's the standard. It's the gold standard um, in terms of production, in terms of the quality of um, every aspect of it. So, um, and, and, music is, um, and music is even more dominant 
Like I said, to be a star internationally, you've got to make it in the United States. So the, the record music industry um, has two components. Um, or the, the music industry has two components, the recorded industry and the live industry. These are two s fairly separate components um, that have their own business models. One of the things about these components is that um, in the past, the live component was not important. As Epi said, a record company would just call and say, book this band. And in fact, tours were used to sell records. Um, you could call a record company, if Epic could call them if you wanted to, or you know, say, I need tour support. You want me to, to play, I need $500. Or you'd buy tickets, or whatever it is, but tour support was essential. And to a large extent, the major record labels financed the tours. Because selling records was just so lucrative, and as we mentioned in those days, nobody knew how many records were sold, including the artists, so that there was a lot of money that was going into people's pockets. So. It, um, it was all about selling the records. And what happened is, is that live, the live uh, part of the industry really didn't take off until records sales began declining because of the changes in technology. Today, there are no record stores to speak of. Um, and as you can see from, from the 80% um, of the revenue today of all music being sold is through streaming. And if it, it, it's actually kind of miraculous. And, it's, and in some ways, the, the record labels had to be forced to go over to the digital format. And Steve Jobs, when he negotiated with the record labels, had the power to force them to accept downloads with Apple at a price that Apple, as Steve Jobs was very clear that they will steal People are stealing your songs, and then unless you price it properly, they'll steal. So Steve Jobs and the technology companies forced the, ma the labels into the digital realm. And then yet today, streaming has now become the means by which is saving the record industry. And we're going to go into that in a little bit. But um, it's a very interesting change. The live music industry is doing very well. But at the same time, it has a very serious problem. The acts that are doing well are all in their 70s. I mean, to think that you will actually hit your peak in financial power in your 70s is really nice. But um, in 2017, the six largest tours were U2, Guns N' Roses, Metallica, Depeche Mode, Paul McCartney, and the Rolling Stones. Okay, Guns N' Roses, maybe he's, they're in their late 50s or 60s, Depeche Mode in their 60s. Okay, so, you know, they're not that old. But the thing, the point is, is that the new artists cannot sustain the live, the, the live uh, business model. They are not, they just simply do not have the drawing power that these acts like Paul McCartney or the Stones have. And what it's done is, is that it has created a premium for live music, which is very interesting. And as you can see, it has especially taken off right at the time, around 2005, 2000, when the record industry just fell off completely. So that in 2005, the Rolling Stones' gross per show was 3.8 million. In 2017, it's now 9.23 million. So we're talking three, four hundred thousand dollars a ticket. Um, and, um, and when they go, when the Stones go, there's nobody to replace them. And that's a serious problem for the live music industry. Um, Hang on one second. So if you, in some of the materials that we gave out, there was an article called The Impending you know, Demise of All Your Legendary Artists, and it's in the package of materials, and you see the ages of all the different artists out there, and that's kind of what Alex is talking about. Oh, just, just while we're here. All right, the program code for those listening at home is 908F9. So that's 908F9 for those out there who are taking this either on DVD or on YouTube or some other digital streaming format. What, what I wanted to also go into, just, just to get a, a basic understanding of the business, is just the structure of the music industry. And then we'll go into the structure the, the, of the entertainment industry as a whole. They're very similar. And in our view, the structure starts with the artist. I mean, the artist is the content creator. And the artist can be a composer. It can be a, a band. It can be, sometimes it's a producer 
who puts bands together, but ultimately the artist, it starts with the artist and starts with their songs. And inevitably there's a manager. And one of the things that's missing today in the music industry, I think, is the manager. Um, uh, you were talking, to some of the people you're talking about, but you didn't name them like Albert Grossman. Um, these guys were enormously powerful. They were lawyers, many of the managers. They could call, if you, they liked you, they could call a record label. They could call Armored Erdogan or any of those, you know, Clive Davis, say, sign this guy. And they would, you would sign, they would, he would sign them, just on his say so. Um, the manager is the person who basically takes the artist, a raw product, a person who has, you know, somebody who has no idea what to do next, but has talent, and um, molds them, sculpts them, and then gets them a deal. And then, uh, and supervises their career. They have names like Brian Epstein, Andrew Luke Oldham. These guys actually become quite famous in their own right for uh, what they did to transform bands like the Beatles or the Stones into a marketable commodity and sell them. Um, so, um, so the manager is crucial um, and it's really a missing link today. These people are not there anymore and bands are managing themselves, which is really a problem because Artists, it's not what artists do, and, and it takes a, a lot of skill and know-how and also connections to be a great manager. The next group is the agent and the publisher, and, and we're splitting up here because the agent is the live guy and the publisher is the record guy. So as the artist begins to uh, move to the next level, the agent begins to book the artist in venues and the publisher begins to sell the or move the artist's songs in recordings. From that point, it goes to the promoter. And the promoter today, for example, Live Nation, the promoter is somebody who um, takes the risk of putting your show on. Um, there are venues, such as my father's place, where we are not just a venue, we are the promoter. So we buy the act and we put them on and we take the risk. Um, but there are places like Madison Square Garden or, you know, a giant stadium and things like that where the promoter rents the venue and, and basically cuts the deal with the venue. So the promoter can be local. In, in the old days, just like the record industry, the promoters were a mafia and extremely powerful. Um, they, um, they basically had the rights to the big venues. So you couldn't book a venue because they had the right to them and they would block them out. And they, um, and they could, you know, if, if the live uh, promoters decided that they didn't like your club or you pissed them off, they could just simply call it, it would just be unsaid, you would never get another act again. So the, the, they had an enormous amount of power. In fact, they had the same power as the record label, but in the live business. And of course, the record labels were dominated in the same way as the, the promoters. There was really only seven at the time that were extremely powerful. And um, so, so those, were, those were the two um, really institutions. And, uh, and then of course you had the publicist. One of the things that made the ante so high is that you had to promote the record. You know, these people would promote it. So people would know about it. You'd be on TV, you'd be on a TV show, you'd be on the radio. You'd put the $250,000 down, exactly. And the publicist, or the promotion person would deal with that. And then it went to distribution. If in a live act, you go to the venue. In, um, with recordings, you go on the radio. But sometimes you go on the radio as a live act, and they play your records too. Or you go make appearances. Now you have streaming. That's all part of distribution. You had the stores in the old days. And, and what would happen is, is that the rights to these would be divided up into two parts. Synchronization is the right of your song to be used in other media. Um, so, or actually on, on a record or in any type of media. So for example, if your song is used in a television show or it's used in a commercial, or used in, that's a sync right. And the performance rights are the rights that are used in a performance. So for example, a performer playing this club that plays a Beatles song, we have to pay the Beatles when they play that Beatles song. So, so you know I mean, so, 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 in the live music and in the recording music, the rights to the music itself are then sent out and people collect them and they pay and distribute the people properly. Okay, in the entertainment industry as a whole, it's slightly, 
slightly different. Um, the entertainment, it has, um, okay, good. The entertainment, yeah, the en well, the entertainment industry is slightly different. In the entertainment industry, like films and television, the structure is, is similar except that it's a much more complicated process. So instead of an artist, you have multiple artists. You have actors, you have directors, you have writers, you have costume designers, you have set designers, all of whom have rights of a certain type. And they, have, they don't have managers, they have agents, or they have unions that represent them. And from then it goes to a producer. And the producer is really the <coughs> middleman in this situation. Um, the producer can be a production company or they can be an independent producer. But they generally are most television uh, networks and most film studios have producers or production companies that they work through, that they hire, they contract, they become a part of them. Sometimes they are actually just a subsidiary of the company, but many, many times a day they're simply independent companies that are under contract by these large studios to then uh, deliver content. And from then, from that point on, again, you go to promotion. And, and here's where the ante gets really high. To release a s film, you need 40 million in promotion. If you don't have 40 million dollars in promotion, don't even bother releasing that movie. So no, that's on top of what it costs you to make that movie. And so what happens is it, again, it, it, it basically keeps everybody out of this business. Yes, you can maybe have an independent hit every now and then going to a film festival or things like that. And, but even then, you would have to be picked up by a major studio to succeed in the business. So to a certain extent, the film, the film business and, 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 and the television business in the same way um, have a, some of the old aspects of the model of the music business. And the reason why the music business is a good study is because it got hit first by the changes in technology. It was easy to steal a song. It was small, compact, digital file, easy to download. A movie was not easy to steal. Only today are you able to download that file and take it. So the, the, the movie industry is, um, you know, the, the music industry is really a, um, what has happened to the music industry is really a lesson to the rest of the entertainment industry. And so, for example, many of the same things that are happening to the movie industry, for example, the sales of, you know, uh, DVDs and things like that, they're going the same way as the sale of albums. They're going nowhere. So, and one of the things that's happening, and, and as you can see, um, in, and I'm just putting these graphics up, um, you know, with retail not becoming a factor, Netflix's revenues was greater than the entire box office in the United States in, t in 2018. And what that means is that the, the movie companies, the film studios, have seen the writing on the wall. And what they are, they are now starting their own Netflixes, their own distribution channels, as a way to compete because what the, the revenues of the streaming services are now so much greater than even just the box office of movie theaters. And despite the fact that the box office of the movie theaters are at a very high point, they haven't been declining. They've actually been growing. So what's happening is the streaming services are just simply surpassing it's a new way, it's a new world, it's a different world, and if you want to succeed, you have to adapt to this new world, you can't fight it. And that's what the film studios, along, and the film studios and television studios are so close to each other that they're difficult to separate now. It's difficult to separate, it used to be before that a, t a movie made for television w was junk, <laughs> and a movie made for the theaters was, you know, really classy. Nowadays, movies made for television may be much superior, say for HBO or for than a movie made, a movie made for the film. So, so the thing is, is it's a different se separation. But the point is, is that that industry, the film industry, sees sees it coming, and they're moving very, very fast to transition from the theater, and the movie theater to the streaming services. So we're we're seeing that transition. Now, as an aside the big guns are coming into play. And the big guns are Apple. The big guns are, wait till Verizon comes in. These are companies with enormous amount of money that are in the tech 
technology business. They understand that technology and content go together. Apple decided, and they, they're a startup in this business. In this business, they're a startup, and they put in $6 billion in their little startup. So for new content. And what that means for anybody who's in their entertainment business or wants to be in the entertainment business is that there's gold in them, their hills. In other words, the fact is, is that the music business in attempting to keep control of the Titanic <laughs> went down and they failed to monetize these changes. In. But there's money there because clearly these large tech companies have begun to start spending it. Netflix's budget for original content this year is $15.8 billion. So what you're seeing, they know they have to put it up to compete. So what you're seeing right now is an enormous influx of money into the entertainment business. And what that means is that people are looking for entertainment as a way to further their technological goals. You know, their, their, their goals of furthering technology. So what I'd like to leave you with in the discussion in this transition is, is that, yes, for certain industries, when they held on to the past, like the music business, the old guys, the, the, the good old boys that ran it, yeah, for them, this transition has been a disaster. But for new people who don't, weren't a part of that, this transition is an opportunity. And so we, for example, are, are doing a lot in that world and are finding our own niche and are being very successful at it. So that's just a kind of like an overview of the industry that we wanted to give you, just to give you a, you know, a sense of where to start the discussion from. Thank you. All right. So we have like about a minute or so before we should probably take a break. But one of the things that we're doing you know, as a business, because um, I'm the general counsel of my father's place, is that we're really trying to have multiple streams. So we have our radio enterprise. We have our merchandise enterprise. We have television that we're in production right now. We have our live events. Um, one of the great things is that we have Epi who does all the booking and interestingly he just calls people on his phone because <laughs> he knows you know, all the artists directly and he just makes a phone call. Um, we have you know, incredible people to record shows here. So one of the things that this enterprise does is it, it creates on basically a daily basis content. And in this economy, content is everything because without the content, there's nothing to stream, there's nothing to sell, there's nothing to pitch to you know, the Netflixes and the Verizons out there who need the content. And one of the things that as lawyers who may be representing you know, emerging artists and things like that is look at the content, look at the streams of income opportunity because they are out there now. And as a, you know, one of the reasons why I wanted to go through the history of the entertainment business is you can't know where you're going unless you know what the past has been like. Uh, we're going to take a quick five minute break, but Mark, while we're on the break, would you mind showing the graphic of m music sales between 1969 and 2019? That was, the U that was a YouTube clip, but it was, <laughs> it's kind of an interesting thing. Um, is it on USB? Yeah, it's on the USB drive. But just to have, in case you're sitting here and you, you, you whatever, it, just to show you who the emergency, ar the merging artists were. Best records? Yeah, best selling records. You'll see how much you know music, who was dominant in the field, and how much that's changed. And you'll see not only has the technology changed, but the tastes have changed too. And we'll, uh, if you ever need anything, any of the stuff that we have, um, you can send me an email at radio at myfathersplace.com. I'm actually the radio host. So radio at myfathersplace.com. I'll send you anything you need. The PowerPoint slides, our YouTube links, you know, some of the other cool stuff. Um, and one, one other shout out is, I need to shout out to Emily because we talked about behind the scenes people, but Emily is our general manager here and she does a great job and she's actually right in the forefront. So we're gonna take a quick five minute break and then we'll come right back. We'll try to make sure everybody gets out on time. All right, so five minutes. But if you wanna see, that's a kind of a cool graphic of, of, of who the artists were um, selling the most units. I saw a quick break. Okay. No, we, we have another hour. Yeah, yeah we have another hour. So, yeah. Five minute break. <laughs> 